divide and conquer. The words are repeated so often in the context of how governments and authoritarians and others who would wish to exploit us manage to control us. And this is nothing new in modern politics. You look at polarization, the way that Americans are divided on this silly left-right spectrum arguing over what flavor of statism we should have. Should we have red-flavored socialism or blue-flavored socialism? I don't know, but let's fight about it. Let's be divided, right? Because that's how we make ourselves vulnerable. A free society, a just society, a loving society requires communication, connectedness, human beings able to reach out to each other and share their ideas, their thoughts, their fears, their hopes, their dreams, their basic observations about reality. And today, unironically, is our first day not being censored on YouTube after being banned for reporting some mainstream news stories from the BBC and from NBC talking about corona false positives in the tests. And that's a thing. If you don't know that's a thing, you better know that's a thing. And it should tell you something. When you see a message being censored, that it's a threat to somebody's racket. Someone is trying to get away with something. And somebody's saying something, <laughs> like us here, trying to stop them has to be forcibly silent. But there's a self-censorship that's going on right now among Americans. Where we're not being censored directly well, we are, but we're not just being told, hey, you can't say this. Hey, you can't say that. Hey, you can't question the mainstream narrative. The title of this story today from Newsmax is both disturbing and enlightening. Third, have stopped talking with someone due to coronavirus. Yeah, a third of Americans have stopped talking to someone due to coronavirus. And it's not because we've been so propagandized to think that you can you can get the virus by, you know, talking to someone on the phone. No, 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 no. We're not we're not that scared into submission just yet. One in three people have stopped communicating with someone they know because the individual did not take coronavirus precautions seriously enough according to a recent study connected by Stana. Now, the first thing about this that's revealing, before, before we get into like the main point, why this is so important to acknowledge and recognize and get past and, and, and grow and learn and be better in love and freedom as a result. But first of all, if a third of people have stopped talking with someone because the individual did not take the coronavirus precautions seriously enough and by the way just just to be perfectly clear the whole thing about masks yes doctors wear masks in surgical environments because spittle dropping into a patient can cause an infection in an open wound no kidding and the science will tell you that yes wearing a mask limits transmission because if I'm standing in front of you and you're, you're, you're and I have a mask and I sneeze, yes, less viral droplets are going to hit your face. But for those of you normal human beings listening to me right now who go out and have like regular life, what was the last time someone was like looking at you and just <laughs> sneeze like right in your face or just coughed in your face with, without without covering their mouth? That's not how society works already. People don't do that. We have we have a decent sense of distancing. Now, I will say, I'm I'm actually kind of glad that people are becoming slightly more viral viral virus aware as as a germaphobe. Yeah, wash your hands, cough into your elbow, not your hand, and then go shake hands. And you know, if if you, if you can clean 
door handles and you know th things like like i'm yes absolutely I'm, I'm all for that but the science about masks if you ask the right question do masks reduce the risk of viral transmission when worn for prolonged periods and the answer is no they actually have the opposite effect the government is trying to make you sicker with this so but the the, the perspective on this story is that you didn't take the coronavirus precaution seriously enough. Now, I mean, this would be like me going to my to to, to someone in my family, we'll just say, who thinks that masks are, are essential and useful and be like, you're not taking this virus seriously enough to look at the, enough to look at the science and figure out what the science actually says and, and stop doing this counterproductive thing that's making it worse. Now, by the way, the theories are, you know, like uh, that, first of all, the, the virus is so small that when you put it, when you when you wear a mask, if you if you actually sneeze with the mask, it's like a, a mosquito trying to stop a mosquito with a chain link fence. The the, the micron size of the virus versus the, the the gaps in 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 the fabric, you will you will actually spread the virus. You'll aerosolize it instead of like droplets going out and hitting the ground. They 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 create a cloud and they're in the air longer. Another one is that you have a wet moist environment. That's uh, created breeding ground for viruses and bacteria. If you're wearing it all day, if you're not a surgeon who's who's scrubbed up and has the discipline of uh, of sterilization habits, then you're going to be touching your face and touching surfaces more. People, people. So there's that. Uh, there's the lowered oxygen rate. If you if you continuously lower your body's access to oxygen, shocking, right? You're going to have consequences for your immune system. So I'm I'm disturbed that there are people who aren't taking. The, the, this seriously enough to look at the science and go, wow, government's doing something counterproductive again. <laughs> surprise, surprise. But I would never stop talking to someone. If anything, I would be inclined to talk to them more. Maybe it's just me. Maybe, maybe I'm maybe I'm weird. I mean, a lot of people, you know, they, they see people disagree with them and they go, ah, you disagree with me? Well, fuck you. I'm never going to talk to you. And for me, I get, well, you know, as a libertarian, I my my worldview is is based on ethics, self ownership, the non aggression principle. If there are people who actively don't believe in that and are going to vote for a duopoly candidate and further the injustice of the American government, I want to talk to you. I want to point this out to you. I want to reason with you and show you love and compassion and logic and reason. Hopefully, but. Like what leads people to to do bad things? Mommy didn't love you enough. Well, yeah, <laughs> yeah, that's part of it, right? It's past trauma. It, it's deficiencies of love in their life. And what do you do? You're gonna, you're gonna cut them off? I'm all for you know uh, the, the 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 libertarian concept, the justice concept of of disassociation, of ostracism, ostracism. If someone is a threat to society, yeah, cut them off. You know, let, let them go, let them go live, uh, you know, by themselves and, and have, have their own, you know, personal isolation. But even then, do you not want to talk to that person? Is, is talking to them going to put you at risk? I don't think so. And we have been led into this backwards mentality now. 29% said they have stopped interacting with a family member. Well, another 13% said they had cut off communication with a friend over the issue. Other results from the survey include 29% have taken part in a social media argument over someone else's social distancing habits, while 21% had an online disagreement about their own social distancing behaviors. Now, I, I missed a point. I want to step back here. If one in three people have stopped communicating with someone they know because the individual did not take coronavirus precautions seriously enough, that means there are a lot of people questioning these things more than they want you to believe. So just for a second, take a look at these numbers. Just, just consider this. 29%. You are not alone. Whatever side of this you are on, 
But you know what? There's a there's a there's a false majority here of of people who are trying to bully the minority into compliance, right? Oh, everybody's wearing the mask, therefore everybody believes in this. And if you're not wearing a mask, you're the freak, you're the weirdo, you're the one who doesn't care about public health. And in some ways, it's true that most people have been scared into wearing masks, at least at times. And I, you know, it's funny that like a third have stopped talking to people. That's their answer to this. Even even to say it's one percent of the population, and then a third of the rest stops talking to them. That's kind of a sick, inhumane way to deal with this. But it's not one percent. There's a lot more of us. And you know, you go to Walmart, and it like you know, most people just. Wear the mask to go along to get along. Like, hey, there's a sign at the door. I'm being asked to do this. I'm going to comply. Because we made to be compliant. And this isolation, when the more isolated you are, the more dependent you are on information from the authorities. Hence, divide and conquer, right? If they can just keep us conversationally divided. If they can dominate communication through the mainstream media, through government edicts, then you're less likely to question it. You don't, you don't, it, it's a lot, you know, and, and even for me, even as a libertarian, a lot of us as libertarians, we go, well, gee, I'm the only one in my family who's a libertarian. Am I, am I the only one? Or if you're, if you're living alone and, and, and you hear this, the, the, this propaganda from the government, you know, you want to question it. But because we're, we're, we're cautious, intellectually careful people, rational people, you know, when, 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 when we see, hey, may, you know, the, the mainstream is telling me this, I don't agree with it. We, we ask, we're self-conscious, you know, we, we want to question and challenge ourselves too. I think that's, that's critical for intellectual integrity. And you go, am I, am I the only one who sees it this way? You turn to your neighbor. Hey, man, this seems fucked up. Is this fucked up? Oh, yeah, I had the same response. This is fucked up. Because if you go, hey, neighbor, hey, friend, this is, I, you see this, this, this news, this propaganda, I think this is fucked up. And your neighbor goes, oh, no, it's totally normal. Because, you know, you go, oh, okay, well, then, then maybe there's something wrong with me. But, you know, we question this. And when the mainstream says we're wrong, that doesn't dissuade us. Because we know that oftentimes the mob is wrong. And throughout history, the mob is always, the majority has always been wrong about something. There's a great Wikipedia article I had to share with someone in an online debate about this, about superseded science. You know, I, I don't know if you know this, but people used to think the earth was flat in the center of the universe. <laughs> yeah, crazy. People still, oh shit. Did I mention the flat earthers? I shouldn't. Because every time you do, those freaking trolls win. But no, yeah, people used to think the Earth was flat in the center of the universe. And then along came science and said, hey, most people are wrong. And it, it wasn't like, hey, newsflash, and then everybody fixed it. No, like, it took a long time. People used to think that leeches, you know, bloodletting, was an effective medical treatment. I mean, I could go on and on. There's so many crazy examples of this. How does humanity progress? In many ways, it's because people were willing to be brave and stand against the herd and say, maybe the herd is wrong. Maybe the majority is wrong on this one. Maybe we need to update these ideas. And they were willing to be the first to question the mainstream paradigm. And in order for that to work, the mainstream had to not stone them to death. The mainstream had to be willing to listen and have that conversation. And it's great. I come to you saying this on our first day uncensored on YouTube. Maybe we're going to get cut off again. But this is too damn important. So back to the numbers here. Let's just take, take a measure of how badly we have let things go. 53% had someone close to them who was not social distancing to the extent that they feel necessary. 64% said they had rules for how far of a distance to keep away from others. However, 
only 44% said they had rules for who they had wel- who they would welcome into their home. 62% said they would have family over to their home, while only 38% said they would invite a friend over. Now, this is really important because our means of connecting with our friends is severely limited right now, to say the least. I mean, we had an example just the other day on the show where someone was talking to their neighbor in their front yard and a neighbor from across the street called the police on them for not social distancing. Yeah, I think I'm going to call this the coronavirus from now on. And, you know, there, there are some consequences to this, there, to, to this, this isolation. And one of them is increased rates of domestic violence. One of them is increased rates of child abuse. Yeah. You want to talk about an underreported story of 2020. It's for the kids, except that, you know, we don't care that our policy is increasing child abuse and we're not going to talk about it. And then there's the suicide rates. And we don't have the numbers on this decisively yet. But we have enough numbers from at least limited areas where doctors have said that there are more people dying from suicide than from coronavirus. And of course, we know that only 6% of the CDC's reported deaths of about 200,000 actually died from just the coronavirus. So, you know, even there, you got, why am I talking about false positives? You have to take these numbers down and put them in perspective and see what this really represents. All right, long term, by the way, I hope this serves as a warning for two things. I mean, one, for the fact that, yes, viruses like this are a normal part of our current experience in the global human petri dish and we all should be a little bit more health conscious yeah but when the cure is so blatantly worse than the disease hopefully when the next virus like this comes about that the government and the media and all the corrupt conspiracies you know they, they want to to blow up in order to increase their power and, and rip us off Maybe we we will have learned this lesson. Maybe we'll be warned about this, you know, kind of like 9-11, right? And whatever your take on 9-11 is, there's no way it was a, a, a justification to invade and occupy two countries on the other side of the world for decades. And again, like regardless of what you think of this virus, all of the hate and discontent and division and mandates is not helping there's no way that you can say that this is justified. That Oh, yeah, let's just add $9 trillion of liquidity to the market so the rich can keep getting richer and the poor can keep getting poorer, as is the only real purpose of government. But I want to get back to this particular aspect of the story right now because I do think this is critical. I do think this is a linchpin for what we're experiencing right now and possibly how we get out of it. Among parents, 44% said they would allow their children to have friends over, although only 30% said they would let their kids visit the home of a friend. Let's put those numbers in reverse. 56% of parents would not allow their children to have friends over. What are you doing to your kids? This is this kind of forced isolation of children now. 30%, only 30% said they would let their kids visit the home of a friend. 70% won't let their kids go to a friend's house now. And this, you know, to, to the security state issue, right? Why, why do we have so many Karens, Kens and Karens calling the cops on a regular basis in this country? Kens and Karen's continuously calling the cops on neighbors and, and, and people who are not hurting or threatening anybody. What this is saying is that we'll, we'll, we'll let you come over here, but I don't trust you with my kids. You should trust me with your kids. 
so you know, thirty. What's the difference? Thirty-four versus thirty versus forty-four percent. There are fourteen percent who will say, "Well, you can come over to my house, but I'm not going to let my kid go to your house. I don't trust you. You might not be washing your hands enough to prevent my kid from getting a virus that has a what is it for kids? Point oh oh one percent chance of them even having symptoms." This is this is this is the true tragedy of this pandemic. The survey was conducted among 983 people on the Amazon Mechanical Turk platform. The average age of respondents was 38.31, standard deviation 12.2. The study relied on self-reporting, so the data could be exaggerated or underreported, and it has not been weighted. So, how would you think this data might be skewed? If anything. I would say by self-report, this is probably underreported. Who's who is eager? So this is just a typical thing with surveys. When people have a reason to be embarrassed about saying something in a self-reported survey, you're going to get less of it in the survey than you have in reality. I don't think people are eager, eager to say, oh yeah, I've cut somebody off. Oh yeah, I'm having arguments. Oh yeah, I've disconnected from people. So what do you do about this? I mean, as an individual, it's one thing to say, okay, I'm gonna I'm gonna stay centered, I'm gonna, you know, not let myself be affected by this. I'm gonna stay happy, I'm gonna stay in control of myself, I'm I'm gonna do my best, I'm gonna stay, I'm gonna meditate, uh, I'm I'm gonna I'm gonna you know make sure that I stay focused on self-care, that I'm I'm getting physical activity and I'm eating well and I'm sleeping well, staying hydrated. But that's not enough right now. And I really want to call on everybody who's who's watching this to realize that there's an extra effort that is needed now to combat this. And I don't know what form that might take for you, but don't cut people off. I don't think I have to tell people who watch this show. People who have wronged you, said things you don't like, people who you might even just have an involuntary, unpleasant response to, don't cut them off. Talk to people. Reach out. And especially right now, this is unlike even in times of war. We are more divided and disconnected as a people than, than at least... I'd say ever before by my understanding of history. Although in a sense, thanks to digital communications and devices online, uh, we're still more connected than ever before. But it's not enough to just say, well, these devices are there. This technology means nothing without deliberate, conscientious use and active engagement. And so I would call on you to not just stay centered in that love and practice that self-love, but to project it. Don't, don't hide your love away. You got to get out and share it with the world passionately, deliberately, conscientiously. And there are people who will not reciprocate. There are people who will ignore you. There will be people who say that you're crazy. And you have to not listen to people like that. Not not listen to them. When people are speaking out of fear and hate and by the influence of propaganda, in a way, it's like it's not them talking even. The involuntary mouthpieces of the propagandists just regurgitating what they're being told. Don't let that hurt you. Don't let that dissuade you. As always, the message of Adam versus the man is to be patient, persistent, and always loving. And especially right now, I think more so than ever, we have to project those values and reach out with love and compassion and energetically connect with people right now in this time of great disconnect.